myths and truths about preventive interceptive orthodontics. I decided to make a video about myths and truths. Today will be a bit different as we have a special guest. Watch to find out about what people discuss most and whether they're true or not, especially regarding treatment with children. Welcome to this channel, my dear doctors. I am Ray and Pinto Orthodontics Professor and Orthodontist. Today's video is about myths and truths, as I mentioned, but in a new way. I don't know if you know Edgar. I'll show a photo with Pleasure, Doctor. He'll participate behind the scenes. Based on his knowledge of preventive and interceptive orthodontics, he's not a dentist. As a non-dentist, he'll say if it's a myth or true. Then you all can judge. Afterwards, you can evaluate Edgar's knowledge. All right, then Edgar, and you all as well. Do you think it's possible to improve a patient's breathing? Preventive interceptive orthodontics. Yeah. It's completely true. Very good. It's true. Excellent, and it's true. There are many people who talk about this, but they don't know if there's really scientific evidence. And there is a lot of scientific evidence about this, about improving breathing with certain treatment protocols. There are three treatment protocols for breathing. The first is rapid maxillary expansion. The second is rapid expansion with maxillary traction. The third protocol is mandibular advancement. Here is a meta-analysis article about this. I don't know if you've seen the types of scientific literature, but meta-analysis is the most relevant for forming a true scientific opinion because it brings together clinical studies and evaluates if these studies are of good quality. And here, in this article, which was published in 2017, so it's been a while, it shows that there is indeed a significant difference in the nasal pharyngeal area with rapid expansion and rapid expansion associated with maxillary traction, but that this still does not have solid evidence at the oropharyngeal and laryngeal pharyngeal levels. More studies are needed to confirm this because at the middle and lower levels of the airway, there is still no scientific evidence that interceptive treatments lead to an increase in airway space through rapid maxillary expansion. Edgar, are you ready for the next question? Almost ready? If you put it there, you got it right. Comment, I got it right. Edgar, second question. Preventive and interceptive orthodontic treatments are long, long, extensive because they must follow the patient's growth. Miss or truth? Miss. Nee. Very good. Two points for Edgar. Many people say interceptive orthodontic treatments are long because they must keep up with growth. This removable appliance stays in the mouth and is replaced by another to accompany growth. That's a myth. Look, this case here of this patient with a crossbite incisor. And notice that this crossbite incisor needed to be treated very quickly because this boy was going to be part of a wedding and the mother came about three months before the wedding to get the treatment done. So that was the characteristic of this boy's occlusion. We look at the x-rays. All is fine. He uses this appliance. This type of appliance, as you can see, is an appliance with a bite plane and a spring to move the incisor outward. We activate the appliance and after one month of treatment, you can see that the patient was already completely ready. It's a myth that longer treatment is always needed to monitor growth because it depends on the treatment itself. Some orthodontic treatments, like this one, last one month, then the appliance stays in for two more months to maintain results. Others last three, six, or 18 months. So that's not necessarily true. So let's move on to our third question. Can the jaw grow with any preventive orthodontic appliance? Yeah. That's a myth. 
it's not possible to make the jaw grow with preventive or interceptive orthodontic appliances. It's not just Edgar who gets that wrong. Many do, saying an appliance can make jaws grow because patients are class 2. They go through mandibular advancement with the interceptive appliance, and they see an immediate improvement in the convexity and size of the mandible. But later, they end up losing that advancement as the patient grows because jaw growth is genetically predetermined. So, studies by Jacobson, for example, already stated that it was not possible to make the jaws grow. What grows is just one or two millimeters and that this is not clinically significant. So, it starts from the principle of the growth mortgage that you can have some immediate advancement. But this mandibular advancement is not consistent over time throughout total growth. Do you understand? What we can do is use a removable functional appliance to improve facial convexity. These will stimulate and improve the patient's appearance and help prevent bullying. But we do not expect the jaw to grow, at least not so far. However, new studies by Dr. de Klerk are quite optimistic. They're already using skeletal anchorage to be able to carry out treatments and make the jaw grow. But these are still research points over in Belgium. Put comments about your score, okay? Another chance for you to recover your score. I need to be more optimistic. Can a pacifier permanently damage a patient's occlusion and therefore should never be recommended? I think it does cause damage, but not permanently. Myth, myth. Very good. The pacifier, in reality, it's not that the pacifier doesn't cause problems with the patient's occlusion. Surely, the pacifier does have effects that are not positive on the patient's occlusion, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't evaluate each individual case because there are patients who have a greater need for sucking. And at this stage, the child is exploring the world through their palate. There are studies and analyses by psychologists that show that the pacifier truly suits. And as for the situation where the patient is going to cry a lot, then using a pacifier when they are very young is better so that they can be calmer. Because later, when the child gets older, around four or five years old, if they haven't given up the habit, we can provide very good, very effective treatments. We can treat this anterior open bite malocclusion very easily. Often, it's better for the baby to stay calm, and if the baby gives up the habit earlier, the open bite can resolve itself. Last question, Edgar. The question is, is it always better to treat all malocclusions in children as early as possible? No, that's a myth. It's a myth, a myth. Actually, Edgar said it's a myth that treatment should start at five or six years old. Okay, that's the reality. Another myth is many people think all malocclusions need treatment at this age. That's not true. There is a right time to treat each malocclusion. Treat these three malocclusions early, ideally at ages five to six. Posterior crossbite, class three, anterior open bite. Everything else can be treated later, which we will address during the growth spurt when the patient is closer to adolescence. Very good, Edgar. I'm enjoying your knowledge in orthodontics. Intercept course taught you a lot about the intercept course. There are many doctors already on the waiting list to be part of it. So can you finish the course in four months or you can finish 12 months? Study from diagnosis, facial, occlusal, or cephalometric analysis in anamnesis to treatment plans. If you're interested in adding your name to the waiting list, enter your name and your best contact information. As soon as we have openings for the next group, you will be the first to know. I hope you enjoyed this video with Edgar's participation. Leave a comment below and also give it a like. See you next time.